And you'll remember that these seven churches were seven real churches that were in what is known as modern day Turkey, of course. And you can visit all of these places. Some of them are still cities today. And there are churches there, but most of them are just ruins of places that you would visit. And so there are not churches there any longer, just stones. And if you've ever been to Ephesus, you can go to the amphitheater and other things like that. Some of you have been there. Um, But there is an idea that even though this was written directly to these seven churches, um, there's discussion and debate among theologians. Does this represent the, the church overall in seven stages Throughout history, meaning like, let's say like the first 300 years was the church at Ephesus, and then the church as a whole moved to the next church during the, let's say, years 300 to 600. There's ideas that these are different stages that the church as a whole has gone through. Uh, I wouldn't hold to that personally. I don't think that that's right. Um, I think it was written to those seven churches, but there are, again, things in here for us to consider. Are we similar to these churches in any way? What, what ways are we similar? What ways are we different? And how can we be encouraged to either uh, do what they're doing or repent and, and, and change maybe uh, and not do something that, uh, that they're doing? So um, with that being said, I think that churches kind of today, like our church, might be a mixture of some of these. There might be some aspects and one that we're weaker in like one of these churches are, and there might be some that are stronger. So... Uh, I want to talk tonight about the church at Smyrna. We'll see if we get further than that. But let's read through the second church, the church at Smyrna, and then see what the Lord may have for us. So who would like to read out loud tonight for us? Nice and loud so everyone can hear. Oh, you smiled, Miss Debbie. I'd love to read. Oh, I knew you would. I knew you would. Nice and loud, Miss Debbie. Starting in verse 8. Verse 8, Yes. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna, write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison, that you may be tested and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Okay. Thank you. To the angel, we talked about last time. Some say that this could be an actual messenger angel that's over each church, but it could probably more likely be maybe the preaching pastor or the preaching uh, elder of the church that delivers the message. Uh, This message would have been gone to the church in Smyrna, and the preaching pastor would have read this out loud to the church. Can you imagine if this was what, if I was delivering that message on a Sunday morning? Here, I got a message for you from one of these churches, if that was your church. That could be encouraging or quite discouraging, depending on what we have. So the angel of the church is going to write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Who is that? Jesus. Anything significant there? How does, how does it, him being described this way, how is that helpful? He's the king. What he says is right and true. And what he's going to say about this church is right and true. Right? So that'd be one factor. Good. What else? Yes, Heather. It also references chapter one, where uh, he sort of appears. Right. In verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he lays the king on me, they fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. Good. They died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and the keys of death. Right. Good. So referring back to. Chapter 1, the same language there. Good. What else? Anything else that it makes you think about? That, like, uh, in terms of history, history begins with our Lord and it ends with our Lord. Mm-hmm. And, that, and so just kind of showing that, you know, he is the, the Lord of history. Right. Good. Right. Yeah, like we said before, history is his story. Christ's story, ultimately. Yeah, good yeah. Also, um, it could also establish a... Um, nice and loud, so Miss Nancy can hear you in the back. Um, it could also establish a sense of camaraderie with them, just because what he like says, he talks about um, 
the tribulations that they're enduring. Right. Um, it's their suffering. And at the end, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So right. it's like referencing these things. And so, yeah, it just creates that kind of bond. Like, hey, I've, I've been, you know, where you are, do not fear. Right, 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 right. Because he has faced death. Yes. And he's come to life. So he's overcome that. So if you're on the brink of facing death because of persecution, is it comforting at all that your Lord is saying, I'm the one who's died and come back to life. I'm the one who's over that. That would bring hopefully comfort to them in the situation that they're facing. Anything else with how it starts off here? I mean, it's crazy that the church at this time could have been roughly our size. We don't know, but it, very likely could have been a very small church that was meeting compared to, you know, our morning service. And this is who would have been there. And so they would know each other very well. Okay, so yeah, you're going on to uh, what? Verse 9 or 10? Yeah, 10. So I know your tribulation. We're going to get, hold that, Miss Barbara. I want to get there. I know your tribulation and your poverty but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. How about that? Okay, what's going on there? Okay, Pharisees, Sadducees, perhaps, right? Those who are saying that they're Jews, but they're not really Jews. What is a, what is a Jew? Okay. Did you say something over here? No? Son of Abraham. Good. And most of the people in these churches are all were Jews at one time. Right. So they're the people that are persecuting the church primarily. Right. Good. So the Jews would be in that area, and they were were the ones primarily persecuting. You know, really, a lot of the persecution would come if you follow Paul's story. A lot of times it was just coming from the Jewish people, right, who were persecuting the church. Now, again, that moves on, of course, outside of the church um, to uh, the Romans and others. But, but notice that he, he says here that they, they're, not, they're not really Jews. They may say that they are, but they're not really Jews because they don't have faith like Abraham. They don't trust in Christ. So they're not real Jews. And it goes back to our, our time in Romans, if you'll remember, where he says, not all who are from Abraham, are really from Abraham. Just because you're kind of in the same, uh, just because you have the same ethnicity, it doesn't mean that you are a true Israelite. A true Israelite is somebody who has faith like Abraham does. Okay? Yeah? Well, what you're saying, they're basing their faith on genealogy rather right. than on Jesus Christ. Right. And so they think they're superior. Yeah. Don't base your geneal don't don't base, base your faith on your genealogy, but on Jesus. That's like a one-liner. We can put that on the little coffee mug or something. I like that, Ed. Slash Daniel. <laughs> yeah, how about this? How about that phrasing? Um, but they're a synagogue of Satan. <laughs> Back to how, remember, we are talking about how the Lord was speaking through Daniel, of course, and very direct. This is pretty direct right here. This is who they are. This is what they really are. They think they're true worshipers, but they're followers of Satan, ultimately. But I, I, I don't want to miss the first part of nine. I know your tribulation and your poverty. But then he says, but you're rich. What does he mean by that? Are they rich or are they poor? Which one is it? They're, they're rich in faith. Rich in faith? Good. Right. They're, they're how's the word? monetarily, they're poor. Right. And, but spiritually, they're rich. They're rich. Yeah. So notice he gets their eyes off of their situation as far as whether they have money or not. He's saying, no, 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 you're rich. But he says he knows their situation. You ever, you ever had somebody who they're, they're trying to give you advice and they have not gone through anything that you've gone through? And they're trying to give you this advice and you're like, man, you have not walked in my shoes at all. And you're trying to tell me. This happens most often. Not most often. This happens often with uh, sometimes people who do not have children and they like to tell you how you should raise your children. And they say, this is what you need to do. I've, I've read a book, I've watched an episode on something and so this is what you need to do. And you're thinking, no. <laughs> you should not tell me that right now, right? But it also happens with maybe sicknesses, 
losing loved ones. Sometimes people mean well and they're trying to help. But it, doesn't it just seem to mean a little bit more from somebody who has actually gone through what you're going through? It just seems that that's part of the, the comfort that the Lord brings is he says, you know, here's somebody that's gone through that. And so then they can say, hey, when I lost this person or this happened and you go, oh, you, you know what I'm talking about then. You know, that's what Jesus is saying. He knows it, but don't forget that he's experienced it. All the persecutions, all the trials, all the temptations, he's faced those things. In fact, he has died. So even as we have fear or thoughts about death that's coming, Jesus is saying, I'm with you in that. I have even experienced that. I've lost loved ones, and I've died myself. I know what you're going through. I know your tribulation, and I know that you're poor. Do you think that Jesus had a, very, a, lot, a, a big uh, kingdom financially when he was around? No. It wasn't like he had, yo, hey, no problem. Let's go to the refrigerator and pull out more food, <laughs> right? We, we see times of when he was hungry and when he was tired and all of those things. And so we have a Savior who understands When you're going through hard times, sometimes you just want somebody who understands. One of the biggest mistakes that um, pastors will make sometimes or people will make is when somebody's going through a trial, you feel like you have to go and have all the answers for them. Sometimes they just want you to be there. Just sit with them. Just love on them. And maybe understand a little of what they're going through. Listen to them. Don't try to solve it and give all these answers and, and, oh, let me have these Bible verses again. We want to encourage with the Word of God. But we want to give the word in a timely manner, right? We want it to be at the right time. You can give the right words at the wrong time. You ever had that? Yeah. Give the right words at the wrong time. You don't really want to give the wrong words at the right time. That doesn't work either. That's, we're, not, we're looking for the right words at the right time. A lot of times people just want to be able to talk and cry. You know how crying makes people upset? Mm-hmm. You know, they'll say, oh, I just can't stand to see you cry like this. You mm-hmm. know? Well, if you're talking about your son that just died, yeah. you want to be able to just talk and cry. Right. You just want to be able to do that. And so it's important for mm-hmm. people to just be there with you. Just to do yeah. But I love the fact that they're going through tribulation And they're poor, although they're really rich. And he reminds them of that truth. And we need to be reminded of those things too. But he makes sure that they know that. They're seen by God. They're not suffering and and facing all this tribulation and nobody's noticing. Christ notices. He sees it. So now, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Right away, I would be fearful with that phrase. (laughs) Right? Hey, you know, be like, hey, hey, Debbie, don't be fearful about what you're about to suffer. <laughs> Whoa, wait. You have to go back to what he just, rem- you just said. Okay, this is the one who loves me. This is the one who sees me. Whatever's about to come. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. That you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life now Miss Barbara your comment was what a certain, a certain period of time it is interesting that here he, he decided to reveal to them how long they were going to suffer for we don't always get that some of you are suffering now some of you have gone through great suffering or your loved ones has and one of the hardest parts of that is not knowing when it's going to end you're just Waiting, And sometimes if we have an end, and if we're told that, we can, it feels like we can endure a lot more. Okay, if I can just push through a little longer, a little longer, a little longer, I know this end is coming. What's hard is when you don't have that. In this case, he decides to give them those details. You know why he gave them the details? Apparently they needed it. I guess. Right? What do you think, Ms. Faye? They needed to know. <laughs> they needed to know. So if you're like, but I'm suffering and I don't have details, guess what? You don't need to know. <laughs> I was going to say, if I ask you a question and I don't know, you, you tell me I don't need to know. So. You don't need to know. So if you told me, I, I must right. need to know. That. Right, going back to, where's Daniel? <laughs> They're in the, 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 in the fire. I don't know, you don't need to know. <laughs> you want to know, but you don't need to know. <laughs> they needed to know. 
What I love about God is he knows what we need to know. He's made us. Our breath is in his hands. He knows exactly what you need to know. Now, you might want to sit down and be like, God, I think you're wrong on this. I think I need more details than you think I need. That's where you have to trust him and say, no, he knows what's best for you. What's that? So some, yeah. And and who's doing this? Who's throwing them in? Just so you know, the devil's real. One, I, I forget where this is said. It's said, I think, multiple times, multiple ways. But it's interesting how we've kind of made Satan kind of funny in our culture. Like the, the devil with the red and, you know, the way he dresses, running around with a pitchfork and stuff like that. It's, it's become something that's, that's cool, like to, to have, oh, you know, like schools, like where the, the mascot is the devils and stuff. Isn't that interesting? What, one of the schools that the kids play. Williston. 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 The Red Devils. I was like, you know, I know for sure I'm never going to be called to minister in that area because I can't be affiliated with that school. I can't cheer for them. What do you go, Devils? No. We can't do that. Like, it's just, no, but it's kind of gotten in to where it's acceptable. That's why you shouldn't be a, what, a Kentucky fan. In the Kentucky, are they the Blue Devils? I think. No, I should do. Oh, Duke. Duke. You can't be a Duke fan. Just so you know. No. But... It's interesting that the way we've made this where the devil is real and he's the accuser of the children of God day and night and there's real warfare and he really hates you and he's really a lion who's walking around trying to devour and destroy. He's really doing that. He's not some, you know, coming down to Georgia in a fiddle contest. You've ever heard the devil came down to Georgia? Charlie Dane. That's not how it works. But it's interesting, one of the the great moves that he's done is get into our culture in such a way that we don't take it seriously. And this text is clearly saying he's throwing some of you in prison. Now, why is now now remember he gets he's allowed to do that. He has a leash. The Lord allowed, just like the Lord allows Nebuchadnezzar, he he allows Belshazzar, he allows any ruler to do what they're doing, he's allowing it. That doesn't mean they won't, they won't reap judgment for it. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He will make it all right, but he allows this. Well, why, God? Guess what? You don't need to know. Your job, be faithful. He's going to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, that their faith is going to be tested, their trust in God. And for 10 days, you will have tribulation. And here's the exhortation. Don't worry, all of you are going to get out just fine. It'll be great. You'll have your best life now. Not what the text says. The exhortation is be faithful unto death. How about that? How about that? Are we going to get to a time like there are in other churches around the world where your pastors part of what they're saying to you at the end of the service as you get your blessing before you go is go out now and be faithful unto death. It's a little bit of a different ending to a service perhaps, but it's real. It's what people are facing around the world and what they face throughout history. In fact, you don't even sometimes get to go out of the church before you get to be faithful unto death. The church is attacked with grenades like in Nigeria. Can you imagine worshiping and wondering if they're going to come by again and throw grenades into the worship service? So clearly the answer must be that we don't gather anymore. Right? We shouldn't gather if they might throw a grenade at us. We should, we should all just stay home and be safe. It's not what our brothers and sisters are doing. They're going to be faithful unto death. And we go, I don't know if I could do that. Well, you can't on your own strength, <laughs> right? It's going to take God helping us. But there's a part of that they're being exhorted. Be faithful unto death. But notice he doesn't just leave it there. What does he promise? The crown. So it's, how can I be faithful in this life? Part of the answer, look to the next one. Look to what's coming. 
The Apostle Paul addresses this when he talks about our light and momentary afflictions that we face now. He says that they're, they're nothing compared to the glory that's coming. But the moment you take your eyes off the glory that's coming, then they feel like everything. You have to keep your eyes there or it's too much. And that's what I think we're seeing here. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. You can trust that he's going to do that. Other thoughts here? Mm -hmm. Probably not. They, They probably were not actually like worshiping Satan himself. But here's the but here's kind of pulling back like Daniel does and in the book of Revelation does, you're actually either worshiping Jesus or you're actually worshiping Satan, whether you realize it or not. And so when these Jews are worshiping wrongly, they're not worshiping Jesus, rightly they've rejected the Messiah, they're actually on Satan's team. Now whether or not you realize you're on Satan's team, you're actually on Satan's team. There's only two teams, Team Jesus, Team Satan, that's it. And so yeah, they're, they, they are, but probably not like, oh look, there's a picture yeah, of Satan, we're going to worship, not like that. But yeah, I mean... That would go for, just so we're clear, that would go for any person that is not follower of Christ. You actually are under the wrath of God still, and you are actually known as a son of Satan, if you will. That's the team you're on. Any church, I lose that, I use that term very loosely, that is not preaching the gospel, no matter what they call themselves, it's a church of Satan versus a church of Christ or a follower of Jesus. Yeah. It sounds like they're pretenders. Mm-hmm. Right. Jews blood They don't really believe in the true God. Precisely, yeah. Right. They're just pretend yeah. There, there's not real faith there. It's they're relying on their ethnicity that's gonna save them and it's not. That's not how it works. Yeah, good. Other thoughts here. Scary. Scary? How so? They are. Now, part of what our job is, is if they're not a follower of Christ yet, our job is to basically, in one sense, kind of recruit. (laughs) We're going to say, hey, let let us tell you about this team. Let us tell you about Jesus and share with them. But until they, I mean, that's really where we all were. We all were enemies of God. And so they need to know that. Like, some of them them think they're they're fine with God. They're like, no, God and I are great. Again, going back to, I, I worship out on the water. Everything's fine. You just happen to worship a church. I worship other ways, but I'm fine with God. It's like, well, do you believe in, in Christ and that he's the only one? Well, no, no, no. I, I, I believe, you know, my own way. Well, that's, that, that doesn't work. Yeah. And I'm sure that these Jews, um, they were rejecting Christ as the Messiah. They yeah. believed that they were worshiping Jesus. Yeah. And so they were trying to make it seem like they were the synagogue of Satan. No, no, of course not. Right. They thought he was Satan's worker. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. They, they. And again, that goes back into which is some of the challenging language you see even in Romans or as Jesus is coming, he's speaking in parables and it talks about this veil that's over their eyes. Many of them, they just do not see at this point. And so they're thinking, no, no, we're we're doing something good. And really most I mean, you go to most religions, especially um, Islam, you talk to Muslims, many of them, they think they're doing the right thing. It's not like they're like, oh, well, we're against him because, you know, that's good, but we want to be bad. Like, that's not how it is. It's completely like, no, no, you're doing something bad, and we're trying to to actually help. They they think they're doing what's right. But the difference is it's not rooted in truth in the Word of God, and so they don't see that. Yeah. I think what's scary about it is that we're so conditioned. When you said Williston Devils, I've been around Williston my whole life. I never even thought about Right. I could have moved to Williston and been cheering. For the devils. Wearing red. Yeah. You know? And Not I, that red's a bad color in itself. You know, I, but yeah. And never even thought about it. That's right. what's scary. What, how many other things do I have in my life? Yeah. It's kind of, it kind of goes back to the idea of like, oh, I don't know, you live in Babylon and you get assimilated into Babylonian culture mm-hmm. and you eat the food and you do everything and you don't even realize it. That's part of what happens. What, what, what God does with his word and by the spirit is he begins to renew our minds and then all of a sudden we start to see things that we never saw before. And other brothers and sisters point out things and you go, oh yeah, 
I never thought about that before. It never even occurred to me. But until those things are revealed to us, we don't, we don't see them. And you need the word of God. The spirit uses the word of God to, to change us in that way and show us things. And what he also does is not only does he show us about things around us, but he shows us about things in us. You go, I think I've, I've pretty much mastered, I think, all of my sin. I think I'm doing pretty good. Then you start to read the scriptures and the spirit then brings out something else. And you go, oh, no, there's more. I didn't know there was more. I thought I was okay. I didn't, I didn't tell like bold faced lies. So I thought, oh, I don't, I don't probably lying anymore. And then you, you get into it and you start to read and you go, oh, wait. So when I, when I kind of tell half truths, that's kind of the same thing. Or when I purposely don't do something and I'm trying to misguide people, that's actually bearing false witness. Oh my goodness, I'm worse than I thought I was. But guess what the, 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 the great part is? The more that you see how much you need a savior, that just shows you how much greater Jesus is. Right. You go, man, you know, at, at first, generally, when we when we come to Christ or or whatnot, we kind of think we're a lot closer to Jesus. Like, OK, he's here and we're here. And then the further you follow him and the further you get into the scriptures, you start to go, wow, I'm really far away from Jesus. And then you see the grace and mercy of God where he takes you and puts you in Christ. So you are seated with him in the heavenly places. You go, wow, I just want to worship and and praise you for that. Yeah, other thoughts here on this. These, be faithful unto death and you'll get the crown of life. Mm-hmm. Um, I was wanting to go back to the, the devil about to cast you, some of you into prison. Uh-huh. Um, there's one thing when I become the, the when I'm able to control the internet, Okay. One, one thing I wanted to leave okay. is that is that picture of Satan and Jesus arm wrestling, mm. and it's like who's going to win? The, right. if, and you better like and share so Jesus can get the win. The devil, and, and it's and and we get this idea that yeah. Jesus is trying to get people on his team so he can get the, and the devil's trying to get people on his team so. They're equally matched up, and it's yeah. just this, yeah, and yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, and Scripture doesn't speak at that right. at all. Right. We see that there's a that Satan's empire is weak and failing, mm-hmm. and Christ's empire is growing and succeeding. Right, right. Yeah. And and we and I think that's a mentality. If there's one thing on Facebook, that's I what you get rid of, huh? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So with a passion with a smile on my face. <laughs> But, but, you know, part of that is what's challenging is we look around and it looks like Satan's kingdom is really strong. And that's why you need books like Revelation. That's why you need books like the book of Daniel to peel back and show you what's really happening. Because if it doesn't, you go, well, this king's on the throne. Now this guy's ruling and he's killing people and Satan seems to be doing this. And it's just, it's just too much. And it's like, no, everything is happening absolutely according to plan. Now, the problem is we don't know the plan. <laughs> like we, we get kind of the big idea of things, but we don't, we're not on the ins and outs of the plan. And so we trust. That's where eyes of faith come and saying, Lord, you're in control of this thing. And I'm going to trust that you're using it in ways that you say. Other thoughts? The creator can't be more than the creator. Yeah, the creator can't be more than the creator. Right. Yeah, or even Satan even. was created. Right. Satan was created. So, so. Yep. So you can't be up there with God. It doesn't work that way. That's right. And Job's helpful with that, right? I mean, it's a bit confusing and a little interesting as you read Job, but it's very, very telling what happens as he goes and he has to go and speak before God and has to actually say, well, yeah, there's Job over there. He's faithful, but it's because you won't let me touch him. And God says, all right, you can't kill him. Right? You can't kill him. Oh, okay. Okay. And so the story goes on, and Job learns a lot about his own character and his own heart by the end of the story. And as we've talked about before, which is always just worth noting, as the comedian points out, he took, out, he took everything of Job's except his wife. you believe that? That one comedian put, points that out, right? He sa- says, man, Joe, I'm going to take everything from you, even your health, but I'm going to leave your wife around. How he bad? He didn't want to remove all no, I, it could be. Maybe that's what it was. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe that's what it was. We'll go with that, Miss Didi. That sounds good. It sounds good. I don't know. Mm. 
Oh, is that what it is? See, we need, this is why we need to study the Bible together. This great insight like this. Yeah, because some of us might think that something different about her. <laughs> when you read some of the things she says, I'm like, yeah, I know why the Satan left her around. <laughs> she did not a gracious wife, doesn't seem to be at least. All right, so he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Same thing he said at the end of the first church. What does that mean, Miss Faye? He who has the ear. We all got ears. We you don't? Know, I mean, for the most part. Hopefully we have ears, but we don't necessarily hear. <laughs> okay, we don't hear. We don't listen. We don't listen. Pay, attention. Pay attention. Do you know who it is that's going to pay attention to this message? Those with faith. They have ears. They have the ears of faith. So if you have the ears of faith, listen to this message that he's saying to you. If you're like, I don't want to listen. Eh. That means you don't have the ears of faith, of faith yet. If you're saying, who's talking? What's going on? Yeah, you don't have hearing yet. If you have the ears of faith, then listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Obviously, the talking of the Holy Spirit here, the one speaking. And then he ends with this. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Notice in the, up in verse 7, at the end of that one, after the, the ears and listening to the Spirit, they said, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This time, speaking to this other church, to the one who conquers, you will not be hurt by the second death. Another encouragement to conquer, to keep going. Don't give up. Well, why? Well, so far we have two things mentioned of why we don't give up. So you can eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, and so you will not be hurt by the second death. What's the second death? The soul. Death of the soul. Right? So when we have the judgment that comes, we go and we, the goats and the sheep are divided. Those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. They are on one side and those whose names are not are on the other side. Those who trusted in Christ on one side. Those who are not on the other side. Then we stand before God and we as believers, well then what we have done in this life will be tested and you will be rewarded for that. Whatever that looks like. There's debate and discussion of what that reward might look like. But scripture does speak of reward in heaven. So that's why my encouragement like from this morning is don't stop. Keep going. For those of you who are retired, like I said, that just means you keep going and you can now work full time for the Lord. But there are rewards that are coming. And after he separates seemingly the sheep and the goats. Now, what happens with the goats? The lake of fire. Do you understand that generally speaking, hell is not the end? We talk about hell, but that seems to be more of where people go currently when they die. Okay, body goes in the ground. Soul seems to go to one of two places. One would either be both well, in Sheol, which in Hebrew would be the place of the dead. And so one side would be Hades or hell. Okay, so that would be all those who did not trust in Christ. Whether that was before he came, they did not have faith like Abraham in the coming Messiah. Whatever had been revealed to them at that time, they did not believe it. And so they are not in on that. At that time would be paradise the other side of Sheol, the way I would understand it. So those who were around the time of Christ and didn't believe, they would also be there. And those who die now without trusting in Christ would go there to hell. That's why we say, go to hell. That's where that comes from. But that's not the final destination. The final destination is going to be the lake of fire after the judgment. And that's where we, we find out that Satan and even the things of this world are rolled up and thrown into the lake of fire, including all those who have not believed in Christ. That's the second death. If you have trusted in Christ, guess what? You're not going to be hurt by that death. You have life. You die once, and then you have, unless you're Lazarus. Guess he tough. <laughs> or a few others in Scripture. But we will die, and then it's eternal life with God. Those who do not trust and believe, who do not have ears of faith to hear, 
then they experience the second death. So that's the exhortation there. Last thoughts before we close this evening on this one. Is yes. that where they come up with purgatory? That if you pray hard enough and give enough money to the church, they can pray your loved one out of that. Right. So, yeah. So the idea would be right now almost like where people are in hell, that maybe you could get them out of hell kind of. Uh, and then you could maybe pray or pay money and whatnot, and then they could come out. But then they went with an idea of purgatory and that there's some form of payment happening and if you pay enough of that or pay off some of your sins then maybe you can be set free it's just not in the scriptures but yeah what's that it's a big maybe there's no assurance yeah no assurance there right it's essential to the christian faith is no assurance yes right it's a bit yeah have you have you have you ever had have you ever ministered to somebody who didn't know what was going to happen to them they didn't have an assurance of their salvation. Have you ever been around people from another religion in large groups? One of the scariest sounds that still cuts into my brain that I hear are women wailing from when we were in Africa and there were funerals. And I'd go out to the village or we'd be out in the village and there would be a funeral. And what they would do is they would separate the men from the women and they would, the, the wailing that would take place th- that evening after the, somebody had died was just gut-wrenching. And they would just wail for that person is gone and there's no hope. And I think that is what we're going, in one sense, to hear on that day. Now, again, I think we move beyond that because that would be very hard to enjoy heaven forever with that type of thing. But the wailing of no hope is terrible. And like Leanna was just saying, Part of the assurance that we have is, you know, we, we, we still groan, right? We, you all have lost loved ones. You still groan. It still hurts. But you do it with hope. There's a difference. One of the, some of the hardest funerals I get asked to do are people, especially that I've, well, that I've never met. Those are really challenging. But people who there's no evidence of faith in their life whatsoever. And I'm always just like, what do you say? I, I don't know what to say. Like, um... They like sports, right? I mean, they, 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 like, they, they served in the military, maybe. You talk about a little bit about their life, and then you just try to go to the gospel and share hope and say, we don't know where this person is. We don't know that was between them and God, but if you're still here, here's what we can think about, right? And you try to go through that. Very, very challenging. Yeah? The whalers, what, what did they... Yeah, whalers, yeah, yeah. Have you heard this before? That there were, there were those that you could hire. Uh, this still exists in some cultures. In Tur- did, did this in Turkey? It did, didn't it? Right. What, what did they do? you remember? Yeah. Uh, I remember it more in Africa. Okay. Well, yeah. But you would basically, the, the family of the deceased would hire, uh, kind of like what you read about at Lazarus' death. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you basically hire more people to come and wail and, and be at the funeral because the more, in one sense, the more noise, the more of the production, the more important the person was. And so you just, and then maybe, maybe there will be, some might believe that there might be benefits to that as far as the person who's gone on too. But, you know, more people wailing on their behalf. Well, my question yes. is, what did they believe in before they died? I mean, you say... Most of these cultures have something they believe in. Right. But yeah. they don't believe in heaven or hell. And well, they don't know where they're going. Is what, the ones that weird that I was talking about? They well, no, they would they actually had Islam was there. So there was Islam, but there's no assurance with it at all. Oh, so No, you yeah. There's, First, there's yeah. Is all hope it's all well, it's just no maybe God. God will just allow you, maybe. But there's no there's nothing that you can there's nothing that you can do that's going to assure that. Even if you were to keep everything, there's still a maybe. Yeah. Yeah, they couldn't understand when we would talk about uh, the, the security in your faith. Like, well, and they try to correct us. Say, oh, no, we know. No, 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 you don't know. Shh. Like, because they think we would be presuming on God. They were trying to protect <coughs> us by saying, no, no, you can't say, shh, don't say that. Don't say that you know. You, you can't do that. Well, no, we do know. No, 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 don't, don't say that. Shh. No, no, we know. What? This book says it. You got to go back to the word, the promises of God. You go there and you say, I can say it because the book says it. 
And then you have another discussion of, well, that book's been changed. Well, no, it hasn't. And then go into a different discussion, right? Any other thoughts before we close, y'all? So First Baptist Church, Cedar Key. God knows our tribulation. He knows whether we're rich or not, but he knows that we are rich. He knows that there are those who slander us. Those who slander us and slander his name are not of him. They are of a synagogue of Satan. We don't know what we might be facing, but saints here do not fear of what we might suffer or probably will suffer. The devil may do whatever it is, whether that includes prison or anything else. Our job is to be faithful unto death, whether that means from martyrdom or the end of our days. Be faithful unto death, and you will receive the crown of life. And if you conquer, if you endure till the end, if you do not give up, brothers and sisters, if you cross the finish line by his grace, you will not be hurt by the second death. It's true because it's in his word. Let's pray together. Um, I'm going to ask a lady to close us in prayer tonight. Ed really wanted to, but I'm not going to let him. One of our ladies close us tonight in prayer. Ed wants Dee Dee to do it? No. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'll, I'll pray. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gathering tonight and our, our pastor that brings us the truth and we can um, realize it in our hearts. Thank you so much for the friendship and the camaraderie we have. Here and let us go forth tonight and follow your word and follow you and um, live the life that you would have us live. In Christ's name. Amen. Thank you very much. Perfect. Perfect.